as after two videos with well, lots of details and, and uh, there's also a few technicalities, you are all very eager to see what a gradient descent is really all about, right? And this is what, what we want to see now and this is also the key component how most or basically all machine learning models that are nonlinear are trained, right? So this is our situation that we need to work with. The gradient of our loss function should be zero to have a necessary condition for optimality but it's not possible to solve this innocently looking system of equations to solve it in closed form. Right? We've seen for linear regression, you get this method using the pseudo inverse to, to really actually get a closed form solution. For nonlinear systems, you cannot. And so the question is, what can we do instead? And the answer is quite easy. Let's do it in an iterative fashion. And this is something we know from many, many other you know, techniques in science uh, or mathematics. If you want to solve something and you don't have a closed form solution, you do this step by step. We have discussed this also in the area of ordinary differential equations where you, if you cannot solve the system in closed form, you do it step by step forward in time. And here we will do something very similar. Now let's consider a function that looks like this, maybe two minima. And we are going to find one of these minimizers. Then, and this is important, it's going to depend on where we start. We want to use an iterative procedure to update our weight step by step so that the loss function goes down. Okay, so you see, if we now go to the right a little bit with our weight, then we will have to reduce our loss function value. And we can repeat this process, as I said, it's an iterative technique, until we end up after some time in a local minimum, well, which is good, which is what we wanted. The, in such a point, this condition will be satisfied and we will have no option to further move, okay? So, and you also see, starting here, will give us a different local minimizer. And in this case, it's the global minimum, but we don't know obviously beforehand. And this is again 1D. In higher dimensions, this is extremely hard to visualize. So finding a good initial guess, this is what we're going to call the, the initial value of our parameter W, is very, very important to in the end find a good local optimizer or in the optimal case, find, find a global optimizer. So how can we do this? Um, we have seen, okay, this seems like an iterative process. So what we need to do is we first need to define a initial guess. This is what I said, right? We start here or we start here, depending on yeah, what we pick. So we initialize our weight W and I'm going to use an index, an upper index in brackets for the iteration number. So if we have Q parameters, this is a Q dimensional vector, W0, that we initialize somehow, maybe randomly, maybe all zeros, maybe, you know, with an educated guess. This depends on, on expertise in the end. And then we do our iterative procedure, okay? So step two is really using an update. We update W and specifically here what we are going to do is the I plus one iterate will be the ith iterate plus and now two terms that I'm going to define in a bit beta times V okay but not just as it is with an addition such that we have an improvement of our loss function, okay? So the loss function L at W I plus one should be smaller than the loss function at our previous value W I, okay? So if I've done this, I have improved. And then I can, if I can guarantee that this will give me an improvement, I can repeat this as long as I have to until I find a solution that I'm happy with or that in the end, will satisfy some sort of stopping criterion, okay? And so I'm going to explain you in a second what, what I mean by eta and v, but what we do now in the third step is simply check a criterion, okay? So let's say if the gradient of my loss function at my i plus first iterate is approximately zero, then we stop. 
If not, then we simply go back to two and repeat. And this is, I mean, I've taken away a lot of details here and there are many, many ways to do this and different ways and we are going to discuss a few. But in essence, this is really it, right? We start with some initial guess. We have this iterative update rule and then if we have updated in a good way, after sufficiently many iterations, this criterion is satisfied. We can also consider other criteria, but this is what we're going to do for now. Then we are very happy with what we have. Okay, now, well, I've not given you much to be honest, right? I have these two parameters. And so let's talk a little bit about what this is. So we have these two, eta is what I'm going to call a step size. So it's a real number, positive number. And the V, this is a vector, which has to have the same dimension as the W. So this is usually a real valued vector with Q entries. This is our descent direction. Okay, so if we have this, the descent direction tells me, okay, I'm going downhill, simply said. And the step length is telling me how far am I going downhill. And you can imagine this is actually something that is very natural if you stand on top of a mountain and you want to go near uh, or into the next valley, then you might look, well, where am I heading downhill? And then you decide how far of a step to take in this direction. And then you reevaluate, which is maybe the best directions to go downhill. And then you decide on a step length or how many steps to take into this direction before you continue. So really a very intuitive concept. Um, now the question is well, how to determine these. Um, the next video will all be all about the step size, but this one is first of all about the descent direction. So what does descent really mean? What descent means is it's a direction pointing downhill. And I'm going to put this in quotation mark. Because what do I mean by this? Um, what, do I, what I mean is I can compare with the gradient. So what this means is the angle between this descent direction and the gradient of my loss function has to be greater and 90 degrees. Okay, this is easily imagined if you if you consider maybe here to be a, a minimizer and we have two parameters. So these might be level sets um, and we're trying to find this minimum. Then we know that the, so these circles are level sets, meaning that along these lines, the loss function has the same value and then yet another value, a smaller one, and in the middle we have the lowest value. And then the gradient, of the loss function is orthogonal to these level sets. And so what I mean by 90 degrees is that the descent direction V has to point downhill, okay? The gradient points into the steepest ascent direction as strongly uphill as you can. And so the gradient points in a direction that goes downhill. And so an easy thing to do is to set V to be the negative of the gradient, right? So very straightforward situation if you think about. And then so this means going exactly in the opposite direction, right? Not in a curved way, but, but straight. <laughs> and this is what is called the steepest descent. Why? Because it's the steepest possible direction, so we are descending as steeply as possible. And by this, we hope to approach our target um, as quickly as possible. And so this is the iteration process that we need to take. Now we have defined a descent direction. We are multiplying it with an appropriate step length, and this is what the next video is going to be about. 
But before we get there, let's have a look at a little bit of code and see how we can implement something like this in Julia. And so I'm going to uh, go through the code and show you a little bit what I've done here. Not all the details, so I'm blending out a few blocks that are not relevant for, for the math here, but most of what's important is, is, is visible. So we're starting with a, a, a sample size of 10, and we are sampling from a signed function. So you see I'm, have, I'm having 10 equidistant points between minus pi and plus pi, and I'm sampling from the sine function with additional normally distributed noise. So what you see is exactly this, okay? I have a sine function like this, and I'm sampling these 10 points from here to here, and you see, well, equidistantly, sine plus Gaussian noise. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to fit a polynomial model. So exactly what we've seen a couple of times, give me the terms from a polynomial, maximal order three is what we're going to use here, and try to give me the best solution. So if I go down further now, there are some explanatory, explanatory text, which really just considers what we did in uh, regression. Okay, so you see, we have a squared loss function here. We have a polynomial model of this type. And so if you decide now to put each feature vector, so the ith sample into the first row, second row, until the nth row, we see that this is exactly the linear regression problem that we can solve with the pseudo inverse. So this dagger symbol here just resembles the pseudo inverse that we have seen a couple of times before. So a closed form solution, and if you do so, you get um, this solution, where, where is it? Oh yeah, I'm not, uh, before I do so, I'm going to go through um, the functions that we can use instead. So uh, this is just the code to do it. Um, here I'm creating a data matrix, so given some input sample z, these are now my 10 inputs from minus pi to plus pi, and a degree q that I'm interested in, which I'm going to set to four, this just gives me exactly this feature matrix that I had here, right? Um, and then what I have as, as next is to, to train the model, and you see that this is actually a very, very easy procedure. This p inf pseudo inverse is just uh, how to resolve in a one uh, line of code the, the, the regression problem to get an exact solution. And here is just the, in, the, the model in the end that we get. So I'm not going to go, go through all the details, but what we really see is for every sample, little n is now the iteration over the individual samples, I'm going to take wi times z to the power of i. So exactly what we had also in the video before, this gives me my polynomial model. And what I can do now is I can simply do these three steps. I'm setting q to four, as I said, maximum order is, is going to be three, four parameters. I'm creating the corresponding z matrix, and then I'm using the, the training algorithm, which is just the pseudo inverse, to give me the optimal weights w uh, p inf. So this is to, to recognize the pseudo inverse. And what I get now is I can evaluate my model on z grid, which is a very fine evaluation so that I really get a continuous or close to continuous function to visualize what I found. And if you look at this now, what you see is that this is the solution that we get. Okay, so we have here in, in, in the dashed line, this is the exact model without noise. The dots are the samples where I do have noise that I used for training, and the least square solution is denoted in red where you see that you really have this. Well, it's a third order polynomial, so it cannot be a sign, but I would say it's not that bad actually. And so until here, we have not seen anything really new, right? This is exactly what, we, what we've seen before for linear models. And so now I'm going to use gradient descent, even though I don't have to. Why am I doing it? Because I now can compare this against the truth, the, the red line. So let's go further down. And so here's now a, a little text explanation of what I've written here exactly. So the derivative is um, two times the loss function value. So this is loss function specific for a squared loss function, it looks like this. And then we have the inner derivative. Um, so the jth weight gives me z to the power of j as we have discussed in the, in the previous video. So what I get is when I do this for all samples and um, all, uh, all weights at the same time, I get again something that looks very close to what we've known from linear regression already. Right? So I could solve this one exactly now and using the pseudo inverse, I would get the, the W explicitly, but I can also use this gradient expression and then try to, to do gradient descent, just as I've written it here on the right hand side. So now let's go there. 
and have a look at what, what we do is, first of all, I'm defining the loss function, which is just one over n of the two norm of the y minus z times w, so the squared loss function. And the gradient is now exactly what I've written earlier, two times n plus z times zw minus y. So I've switched the minus sign into the bracket, but this is really exactly what I've written before. And now we can simply solve this. Okay, you see here we start with an initial guess. This is what we need. This is our step one. Initialize w0. I'm picking a step length. This is uh, 10 to the minus 3 here. As I said, it's not so easy to get one. We are going to see in a bit more detail which ones, well, how to choose them, let's say a little bit more cleverly, but this is for later. And what I'm going to do now is I'm recording what is going to happen. So this w all is just a, a, an array of 10,000, uh, 1,000 lines, columns, where I'm reporting the weights of all 1,000 iterations that I'm going to study. And so you see the first one is w0, and then here is my gradient descent algorithm, which is really easy. So you see the, this one is exactly the line that I have here in step two. So wi plus one is wi plus eta times v, and eta is minus the gradient now. So I've really implemented the steepest descent direction. So I'm evaluating the gradient at w at iteration i. The data is what I need, obviously, to, to evaluate the loss function because it, it features in the loss. Um, and then I can, you know, take the minus sign here and I do get an update. And here I'm just recording the loss function value. I'm not even bothering with a stopping criterion because I want to study how the loss decays, hopefully, over these 1,000 iterations. And so what you can see is that if I do so, and now in the end I'm just reporting W star as my final one, and I'm going to compare this to the, the pseudo-inverse solution. This is now the YGD, the, the solution of gradient descent. Um, I'm evaluating my model on the grid using this optimal solution. And so here's what I get. Right? And so you see in, in red, we have again the solution that we had before, which is exactly the, the pseudo-inverse solution. And in blue, we have something that looks not quite as good, but it looks similar. Right? And I'm going to tell you a little bit why, why it doesn't look so well. Um, but so you, you do see the shape, right? And here's the, the problem. So what I'm doing now is I'm plotting simply the loss function over the iterations. And you see that we do have a loss decay. This is exactly the, the criterion that I've uh, included here, right? I said L at W i plus one has to be less than L of W i. And so you see that this is a, a strictly decreasing function. So yes, every iterate improves the loss function, but you also see that the, the improvement is quite small. And so 10, uh, 1,000 iterations are not sufficient to really converge. One can show that, we have discussed this also in, 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 in linear regression, we have a convex function with a single unique minimizer, so it has to converge in the end. But here it simply doesn't because we, we have not waited for long enough or we have not made a suitable choice of our step length. And so, here is um, also a plot of the iterations that we had. Well, we started with a, all zeros, which would be a constant line, and then we sl slowly improve our model and it moves further and further to match the sinusoidal line. And I guess you can also imagine it will converge to the, the red line eventually. We will cover this in the next um, video, but you also see that we are not there yet. So even after 1000 iterations, um, this is the, the uppermost line here, we are not fully there yet. So, you know a lot about gradient descent now, right? How to pick a particular descent direction. We've talked about the steepest descent direction. We also know a little bit about the step size, but there's also lots of room for improvement for maybe better descent directions and also in particular, how to pick particular step sizes. And this is what we're going to discuss in the next videos. Thank you.